Hello, live from around the world and quite possibly low Earth orbit and outer space. We're here today for an Atlantic Council Geotech Center conversation about on-orbit AI and cloud computing. We're talking about AI and computing at the edge in space itself. We're gonna be talking about automation, robotics in space, and what we can do to take advantage of these edge-based computing capabilities so that they serve the public and benefit our world. I'm honored to join today with a co colleague and friend, senior fellow Frederick uh, from Unibop, who's also CEO at Unibop. Frederick, could you give us real quick both your role and position and what you see as both the present and the near future state when it comes to AI and cloud computing in space? Certainly, and thank you, David, for that nice introduction and the opportunity to have this web seminar. This is held during the week of small satellites where all we small satellites geeks usually meet up in Utah in Logan for a week. And due to the uh, global circumventing uh, pandemic, we have to do it virtually this year. Um, so I'm Fredrik Brun, CEO of Unibap. I'm also an adjunct professor in uh, robotics and avionics. So I've been fortunate for the past 15 years to work with computer developments and cloud developments related to space and uh, aerospace in general. And what's really interesting is that we're now starting to see the launching of mega constellations. We're starting to see rapid cycles, very much similar to the cell phone industry. We see new generation of satellites launched every year. So we see a tremendous shift in technology. However, it's also important to remember that many small satellites comes with a little bit lower reliability than what we're used to in space. So now when we start to come to a point where it's actually possible to have real cloud computing in space, we also have to look at the reliability aspects as well. And what's interesting is that uh, we as a company, together with our partners, Moog in the US, for instance, have now developed something that we call Space Cloud. And I actually brought a computer so the audience can see that, that a full space computer with CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, neural accelerators, everything fits in a form like a factor like this. And even though we're early on with this, we are very, very pleased to see that NASA will use this as part of their hyperspectral thermal imaging mission. So if we look at it and summarize it, we are now in the midst of the trend of shifting over to AI and cloud computing in space for real. Excellent. And Frederick, real quick, how much power does that board require? Uh, depends on the utilization, but if you really uh, use it uh, fully, it's about 22 watts of power. So the size, weight and power of this thing is 10 by 10 centimeters, 5 centimeters in thickness and about 22 watts. And that gives you somewhere between one and three teraflops of uh, computing power and about a terabyte of storage. So one to three teraflops of processing power, 22 watts on a board that could be in space. And so as I turn next to uh, Shane Hawthorne from AWS, Shane, what does this give us? I mean, what does being able to do AI and cloud computing in space, if you could real quick share a little bit about your position and what you see as the future trends that are happening? No, no, well, thanks. You know, what it really gives us is it gives the aerospace and the satellite uh, community uh, the agility and the flexibility and the speed that the cloud offers. So when you get these types of devices up in orbit and they're actually able to operate in a reliable way, in a secure way, which I think we'll probably end up talking about a little bit more later on in this discussion, you then get the ability to build on top of these great systems. And so uh, like Frederick and I were talking about a little bit earlier, on the Unibot platform, we actually can allow uh, using free RTOS, some of the different AWS services that we have available, such as Greengrass, to actually be able to do processing on the spacecraft and uh, use then another uh, service called SageMaker to be able to train models and retrain models very quickly on the ground. And what that does a little bit is it gets it so that we have customers and users around the world who are just, I don't mean this in a non-space geek way, but being a small set, uh, you know, nerd and alumni as well, there's a lot of folks in the software development world that don't do space like we do, but they do do the cloud, 
They know how to build uh, models. They know how to use TensorFlow. They know how to use Greengrass and SageMaker. And they can very quickly and agilely build things on the cloud and deploy them to the satellite rapidly and be able to do processing on board. And that allows you to open up the floodgates to a lot of the different object detection and other types of algorithms that we can put up there to make decisions and inform decision makers and allow them to have what they are. And I just wanted to close those thoughts, Dave, by saying there's so much opportunity in this area right now. If we could just make sure that we get deep into the space cloud and we actually get our services right so that we give our customers what we want, and I mean all of us in the space world, then we just are going to be able to do incredibly new things up on orbit by giving the customers what they want. And what they want is that speed and agility and flexibility that cloud operations in space will offer. Fascinating. And real quick, Shane, I'm building on that. So, so really, it sounds like you're describing a future in which um, developers that may not necessarily, like you say, I mean, we welcome space nerds, we welcome cloud geeks, but really people that may not know space can actually develop services and applications for space, given this processing power that's now possible at the edge. Is that where we're going? That's it exactly. Our goal needs to become that uninitiated space people begin to find the act of operating in space or doing softwares for space mundane so that it just becomes a normal part of operations. It becomes another tool in the toolbox to use to help deliver the data and the decisions to the customers that they want. And that's why the ubiquity of cloud processing and the uh, ability to let people who know how to, com how to code on the earth be able to code in space as well, that's gonna just break an incredible number of barriers down and really open this market up to everybody. We're going to see a lot of disruption coming as people can take space data and apply it to things that nobody's ever thought of before. Excellent. I look forward to that future. So, so Pierre, we're honored to have you join us as well, Pierre. We were talking earlier that we seem to have at least six degrees or maybe even less, two degrees of separation to Frederick here and that everyone knows him. But for our audience, Pierre, could you first share a little bit about what you do and your role? And then what do you see as the exciting trends, both present and the near future involving on-orbit AI and cloud computing. Okay, thank you very much, David. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, so thanks for inviting me first. This is a really exciting panel. Uh, I'm working at the European Space Agency in an innovation lab, looking at new technologies, and we focused on AI. Uh, why did, did we do that? Because it's the highest impact technology we identify. We have petabytes of data on the state of the planet, ocean, atmosphere, land, uh, AI is the only way we can mine this systematically at the global scale, really having scalability and insights, multivariate correlation, etc. So we are discovering the power of AI uh, on Earth uh, with uh, machine learning, etc., detecting new future using computer vision. And of course, the next step is to bring that power in space. And the way to do that is to do the inference there. And there we are really at a crossword, uh, uh, crossroad of opportunities because the computing now can go to space. I mean, this is really new for us. If you look at the history of, of spacecraft, there was a lot of issue with radiation. And now we can have AI chip going up there. And we are launching one this month uh, to test that capability. So imagine we can bring the agility speed of the machine learning up there suddenly you build a totally new world of opportunities, software defined, where you can uh, create applications and maybe bring these coders uh, that don't know anything about space. So it's like building a Swiss knife with the sensors. And I'm really excited about that, not only for science, but also for commercial applications. Fascinating. And, and, and sort of maybe even going further, it sounds like that what we can do now with edge computing and AI is we don't have to stream everything back down to ground stations. And in fact, what we can do is we can actually teach the machine what we're looking for. And then when it finds it, let us know. Is that where we're sort of going? And, and are there other sort of interesting things that we couldn't do before as a result of this? Yes, so with, with this, you know that uh, launching in space uh, costs money, but uh, uploading a software is a bit less expensive. Um, and by doing this, you can imagine you tailor the applications for the regions uh, you are flying above. 
and suddenly you have multiple applications. Uh, some scientists will not be happy with this because they want to download all the data. You know, some people see this as a waste. But if you go to commercial application and you just need an actionable information, this is the way forward. This thing can actually extract exactly the information you can react on, like an SMS, and then stream it even through radio waves, etc. So this opens a new way to uh, also do other things than the current ground segment and suddenly inform people and having environmental intelligence at your fingertip. Wow. I like that hashtag, environmental intelligence at your fingertips. That, that's a worthy goal to pursue. I just so, made so, it now. <laughs> <laughs> we can make it now. So, so Jody, uh, you've done some fascinating work when it comes to robotics, to, to thinking about what's possible with automation. Could you real quick share a little bit about your background, Jody, and then uh, what do you see as the both exciting present and future trends that we're talking about with AI in space? Sure. So my um, mission in life is to amplify human capabilities. Um, and, and by that, I mean, almost um, instead of creating supercomputers, I work on creating superhumans. And what I mean by that is we adapt the systems to uh, match how the human exists in the world and just amplifying those functions beyond um, what is naturally capable. So when I look at uh, low Earth soap satellites, we get really, really excited about these things because we have to think about where compute platforms are moving. So, you know, the the PC decentralized um, mainframe compute, so that we could each have a piece of that sitting on our desk or our computer. And what we're seeing now with the intelligent edge, meaning IoT and um, artificial intelligence, is that it's deconstructing sort of the, the compute. So it's no longer contained in a safe little box that we have a screen that we want to interact with. Instead, it's now um, the chipsets are actually spread across your space and the, the brains of the computer now live in the cloud. And so what we're, what we're seeing here on planet Earth um, is that we need a way to do that heavy duty compute that we would normally contain in a single box distributed over a number of chiplets. Mm -hmm. And there's also a need for us to do heavy duty computation because machine learning requires some serious GPU power for some of the applications. And so it's no longer possible to necessarily send that ginormous um, processing down to a, a, a contained compute where if it's distributed, there's no, just no place to send it. So we need a way to be able to control the model up in the cloud and then just as uh, Pierre was talking about, send the responses down um, in very targeted ways, specifically to the location. In order to make that really, really powerful for the human being, we need low latency between the request uh, going to the brain and the response from the brain. So by putting satellites in areas, um, just as Pierre was mentioning, over these regions, we can start to create that very rapid sort of call and response on the very edges of compute, which is incredibly exciting. Um, but the other thing is that by creating this low Earth satellite, suddenly we have the ability for humans to not just work local or even globally, but also in in space and there's things we can do in space that we would never be able to achieve here on planet earth so by creating this sort of um commercial access to space without the burden of becoming a space expert we can start to leverage that capability to create real meaningful solutions for people here on planet Earth, as well as our astronauts and our future space bases in in, uh, in orbit and also on the moon or maybe even Mars. So. Maybe even Mars, since we are currently now is the time to be going to Mars. So, so Jody, real quick to, to draw on that, you're talking about how it's the idea of like the idea that we can sort of have faster communication between the satellite brain and, and what's going on on, on Earth. 
is it also the idea that maybe we actually don't just have a satellite talking to the Earth, but it actually could be the satellite might, through through machine learning, actually start talking to other satellites or coordinating its activities as well? So oh, 100%. One yeah, you need the, the, the brain really requires, the, you know, the compute brain really requires that network. And suddenly, instead of relying on a single um, GPU on this localized compute, suddenly you have a network of GPUs that you can leverage to do massive things. But without overtaxing any one of them. So you can distribute. Um, and, and that's what I was getting at. We are looking at this kind of deconstructed compute that means that we're distributing all the different pieces of the compute uh, across multiple um, devices and um, chipsets. And that allows us to get way more power than we could get if we keep isolating it into these single uh, boxes. Excellent. I look forward to when there's at least thousands, if not more, of uh, the device that Frederick showed us uh, in orbit, and they're actually all co coordinating amongst each other. Oh, uh, so I'd now like to turn to Peter. Uh, Peter, you have an August background as well. Could you talk to us a little bit about your role and what you see as the exciting trends, both present and future? Yeah, David, thank you. Thank you, Frederick, uh, for letting me be a part of this discussion. Uh, I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Black Sky Global, and we are a global intelligence company. Um, our, our motto at, at Black Sky is be the first to know. And, and so how do we do that at Black Sky? Uh, I think, it, in fact, we're, we're harnessing these three technical revolutions that we've been talking about already on the panel. Number one, small satellites in low Earth orbit to provide rapid revisit rates over every spot on the planet and high-resolution imagery collected from those satellites sent to the ground where we're leveraging the revolutions in cloud processing and, and the amazing ability to throw tremendous amounts of uh, CPU uh, against those images and then fusing that with open source intelligence from hundreds and thousands of other data sources like news media from 140 plus countries around the world using uh, artificial intelligence, natural language processing systems to pull information out of those news reports, fuse it with social media feeds from all of those countries around the world, IoT data from sensors like Jody was talking about, earthquake reports, weather reports, um, uh, any kind of data that we can geospatially tag fuse that with satellite imagery and use uh, machine vision to pull out key bits of information, and then ultimately provide to our customers intelligence about things that they care about. I, I really liked um, Pierre's comment about, uh, you know, environmental insight now. We want to know what's happening right now. And so we're leveraging all three of these things together, small satellite revolution, cloud revolution, AI and machine learning to provide that kind of insight to uh, decision makers and, and people across the world. I think um, we can think about many examples where now taking those three revolutions and bringing them closer together uh, really gets at that issue of be the first to know. It's really a time-based issue time is really the great leveler for all of us in the world. And the, the closer that we can bring those three revolutions together in time, the better insight and the better understanding that we get in, um, in, in those major events. So for example, we've been using all of those systems now over the last couple of days to monitor the explosion in Beirut. And, and you can see that there's insight in news media, there's insight in social media, there's insight in satellite data to really get out what caused that event. Was it a terrorist attack? Was it an accident? Where are the, where is the damage? How severe is it? Where do you need to put first responders? And, and so you can think about now leveraging all of these revolutions together, bringing it to a point in space where you're, you're reducing time and latency to really provide the greatest impact uh, for people affected by an event like that. Wow, and that's very timely, like you said, with the bombing that unfortunately happened, or the explosion that's happened in, in the area. We don't know the source or, or the cause. Um, and maybe what I would just ask is, is, as you look at this convergence, do you find, you know, how do you, how do you help communicate this to your customers in ways that, that aren't information overload? I mean, if, if you're bringing stuff from space, 
what's the best way to share what you're seeing from space with them? I mean, obviously visual is one, but do you find there's ways that leaders or, or customers want to receive that information? Yeah, for sure. I mean, and Jody talked about this, I think made some great points in the way that humans interact with technology. Number one, yes, we're very visual creatures. So an image um, really does convey a thousand words. Um, but then the, the thousand words that you combine with that image are very important. So, uh, you know, our customers don't have time or the ability to read 140 newspapers in 140 different languages around the world. So how do you use AI and machine learning to pull out the key bits of information and link all of that together to provide context uh, for that image or, or for that event? So, so that's really the approach we're taking at Black Sky is trying to really get at how do you provide that first to know a uh, bit of information to the customer. It's in a combination of imagery, it's a combination of pets um, that, that humans can digest. Fascinating, thank you. Thank you, Peter. And, and John, uh, I'd like to turn to you. Uh, you similarly have a very uh, august background and you're doing some fascinating work involving uh, AI space and, and making sense of data. Could you share a little bit about your role and what you see as the exciting both present and future trends? Well, certainly. Thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in this panel and meet uh, the members of the panel as well as to speak to some of the uh, members of the small set. Conference. Ordinarily, I'd be in Logan with everybody else at the Nerd Fest, but uh, <laughs> it's very interesting to, to deal with it this way. I retired in 2012 as the uh, chief technologist of NASA Ames Research Center. My background and area has been primarily in uh, electrical and biomedical engineering and worked uh, most of my career in life sciences missions, both uh, human research as well as uh, non human research. Uh, in 2006, with the help of Peter Wagner and the company, we flew the first biological nanosatellite, GeneSat, and also in 2009, we flew Pharmasat. And this was the first in situ analysis for biological uh, genomics, uh, gene tagging type uh, experiments and missions. In prior cases, primarily then, and in most cases now, the way uh, life sciences and biological missions are undertaken is that you take the sample of the specimen or take a sample from the human or the biological specimen uh, to the space environment, expose them to the space environment, preserve the samples in a certain way, and then bring them back uh, to Earth for analysis. In a lot of cases, when you have to do that, you preserve and you actually cause artifacts to the specimens that you're trying to understand the effects of microgravity on because you are inducing gravitational stress, you're inducing other preservatives and so forth. So a wonderful way to be able to handle this would, to, would be to be able to process on board and send the information back or in the case of field research or pharmaceutical research or any of these types of research activities, if you're trying to do drug discovery or things like this, you actually impose a challenge, you observe the results, you cause a change and re-expose uh, the specimens to that challenge and do the comparison measurements. When you bring samples back on a, on a one-year mission or a mission to space and you bring the samples back, you may not have an opportunity to repeat that experiment uh, for years or not. So if you were able to do the processing in space there, uh, you may discern information that you've not been able to detect because of the artifacts and the logistics of handling the experiment. So by having this onboard processing power and capability in space, it can provide additional opportunities that heretofore have not been possible. On the International Space Station, you have uh, astronaut tended missions and experiments, so they're able to do those kinds of things partially themselves. But as we go to longer duration, robotic missions, non-human missions, understanding human precursor missions to understand the effects of long-term exposure to the space environment, to radiation, and things like this, uh, there will always be human surrogates that are done prior to that. And to be able to process that information and get that information back, uh, I think, makes a very important uh, capability and possibility. Now, we've been talking primarily about uh, you know, Earth sensing 
and the way that you're uh, doing earth sensing and edge detection and so forth. There are also, if you look at the kinds of things that are done in space, the analysis in space, both earth observation, space observation, planetary detection, all of those kinds of things. If you look at uh, the galaxies, you look at earth uh, surfaces, and then you look at cells and, and other microscopic areas, a lot of the same edge detection technologies, I think are absolutely applicable uh, in this domain and being able to do this type of processing on board uh, and do field equivalent research, impose a challenge, make an observation, make a change, remake your measurements and create better decision-making capabilities, I think will be better not only for space, but in things like drug discovery and in human health and well-being as well. Fascinating, John. And so what you're really describing is a future in which we could have um, AI essentially serving the role as an automated scientist in space helping do experiments. I guess I would... It froze on me. It seems that we have lost the, the moderator. Yeah, I'm back now. It froze, I think, there. I think so, it's David that's frozen. Oh, okay. So okay. Uh, he was basically saying um, it seems that there might be uh, AI and smart uh, medical assistants, doc, doc in a box, if you will, there. That's absolutely some of the kinds of things that are of interest. Maybe not to replace, because there's always uh, the role there, but as an augmented uh, support, uh, in situ support capability where the uh, expert, the specialist on the ground can observe and make some small changes and small executive commands, but your processing system on board can then execute the uh, procedures and processes and take the data uh, that's necessary for those types of operations. I might say that also, in addition to the medical application, if you think about uh, IoT and, for instance, uh, climate monitoring and look at climate variability and changes in climate and being able to distribute multiple monitoring systems and capabilities throughout extreme environments uh, throughout uh, globally and being able to integrate that information uh, and process that information in areas where it may not be possible to have direct internet capability or that you can essentially augment those kinds of capabilities by creating a smart uh, climate monitoring ecosystem is also very possible uh, with AI, just as uh, Frederick has, been, has demonstrated with the high T mission, taking that to a much larger, more distributed global uh, capability. So you're looking at global changes instead of local changes in different areas and interpreting the effect of climate change uh, and the health of our planet. I think that Shane uh, touched upon something that is extremely important also, is that for many, many years in space, we've been developing customized software, which is extremely costly. And now with the cloud computing platforms available, you're able to spin in the software developments that we've done on Earth for 20 years. So if you're doing automated mines, mining on Earth, or if you're an AVS, framework, you can take that framework and apply it on space systems and you don't need to reinvent that software or recompile it for some strange computer architecture that you don't find on, on ground. No, you're totally right, Frederick. And I think we'll talk a lot about some other cool uses of, you know, quick automated detection of things that could then be used to alert from orbit and help us out. Um, while Dave's getting back on, how about I go out and throw out our first question that the panel was going to talk about? And uh, what, sorry to look away from the screen, folks, but what impacts on business models and geopolitical decisions will this higher degree of timely global information from intelligent processing on Earth observation and remote sensing give? And uh, why don't we have Peter go ahead and uh, answer that first? <laughs> Well, thanks, I guess, Shane, uh, throwing me under the bus first. Um, you know, I think we, we touched on it a little bit already. Um, that, that latency and time is maybe the great enemy of all of us. And uh, being able to 
really eliminate that time issue in that whole process of sensing and and sense making and decision making um, really has profound impacts on on so many uh, different parts of our lives. I mean, we we talked about the Beirut example as one of those that. The faster you can understand the scope of a natural disaster or a man-made disaster to really pinpoint where relief efforts need to be made, how to back up logistics um, to support those kind of relief efforts. And, and then ultimately, you know, from a broad um, geopolitical context, understanding very quickly whether that was a, a terrorist event or a, an accident uh, has profound global impacts on on all of us on on how we as a as a you know humans respond to those kind of events excellent and i'd like to now circle back to jody uh my apologies uh i discovered that while one can have a backup power for one's computer if the router goes out which apparently we've got storm activity here in virginia uh briefly lost internet but i look forward to when i can get internet from satellites I would like to turn to Jody and ask for your thoughts as well as to what we can do to address uh, these possibilities and opportunities going forward. Sorry, so we're talking about the opportunities uh, for governments and, sorry, can you rephrase yes. that? Repeat yes, the so if you're looking at, we've got the coordination challenge between the private and the public sector. If you were to sort of play president for the day or prime minister for the day, what would you do to recommend that the private sector do um, and the public sector do to foster innovation in the private sector within this space? Sure. So, you know, there's a, there's, we're at this early day of things. And so the public sector really needs to be involved in making sure that these things remain accessible to, um, to the population and not something that creates sort of um, the, the situation that we're trying to remedy, which is that there's only a, a handful of people that have access to space and who can develop these things. Because because as we move towards more and more reliance on the cloud for really powerful applications such as autonomy, autonomous warehouses, or as John mentioned, you know, uh, medical diagnosis, or you know, any of these things that any of my fellow panelists have been bringing up, if that is controlled by only a few, that means only a few have real access to those tools, and so the the role of the the public is to uh, public institutions is to ensure that we continue to make this open and accessible to a large majority of human beings on both the planet and also in space um, then the private sector what we do best is we um, innovate and come up with ideas that maybe the public sector is limited in applying. So we can come up with new innovations that leverage this sort of space um, networking to do things that we could not possibly do without it. And so we, the two cannot exist without the other, right? The private institutions are the ones that are going to push further and further into what's capable, what the system is capable of, the needs of the system, how we start to um, leverage those and what is necessary from the system. And the public um, sector is necessary to train the people to be able to leverage these tools, um, create the open access to these tools, and really put into, reg into place regulations on how we all play nicely together in this environment um, in a way that doesn't limit one uh, geopolitical space versus another. So, you know, that's th that play between the two is incredibly essential to development. Excellent, and thank you, Jody. And I'm gonna actually field, we've got some questions that have come in from the audience. So I'm going to sort of uh, circle to those and I'll circle back to our, our panelists. But one of the questions that we have, and maybe Frederick, I know you and I have talked about this in a different capacity as Eisenhower Fellows, but we have a question which is, how one handles data regulation policies in space? Um, and so uh, do you have thoughts on that? You know, does, the, is, it, is it the nation that launched the satellite? Is it where the satellite is chartered? Or how would you begin to grapple with that question of data regulations you know, policies in space? And this is one of the really big and difficult questions that we've talked about before. So there is what we do today and what we need to do in the future. 
And what we do today is basically to follow the Outer Space Treaty from 1967. And obviously in 1967, we didn't have so many computers. So that legislation is sort of old, you could say. So we actually need to come up with a completely new set of rules for how to regulate data in space. So today, basically there are none. So um, I, this is a big task that we have as uh, Eisenhower fellows and members of planet Earth to try to solve. Um, the GDPR regulation of the European Union does not apply in space. <laughs> so I don't have a straight solution off the top of my mind today. Excellent. I uh, gotcha. Sounds great. Uh, well, I think it, it's definitely something that we need to think about. I, I'm going to actually circle to, to Pierre now because, Pierre, uh, I, I'd be interested in your thoughts. You're talking about what we can do to address uh, uh, environmental insights for all. If you were to build a coalition, maybe around environmental data, and it was something that, that brought together industry and NGOs and others, uh, how would you go about building that? And how would you think about making that happen? That's a very simple question. <laughs> exactly. I, I do softballs here. <laughs> okay, so they, they should be in fact some guiding principle. Being open, uh, sharing the tools uh, should be at the heart of this. Uh, to come back to the previous question, what I noticed in fact in the um, uh, last five years I've been working on uh, machine learning, it's that it's, it's really a revolution of paradigm if you want whereby uh, you build software automatically from uh, the data. So you are learning from the data how to do the software. And this is really changing everything because you can build software for processes you don't understand. So because this software is eating everything, now the value chain of industry is also changing. And the way we do the business is also changing. Maybe we will have a kind of app store in space where you can download things, pay a very little amount of money and do it and then uh, do another app, uh, all this secure with blockchain. So given that, uh, it would be very important to uh, get coders on board, innovators. So bringing the data open somewhere, bringing uh, the framework for coding open somewhere, get the ideas on, getting this uh, enhancement of human capability by giving the right tools. And then this should generally create the, these apps. Some of them could be for public goods. Some of them could be for commercial. There is a natural synergy coming up. And what we do as an agency is we invest public funding in order to build these tools, the AI-ready data set, and the infrastructure in space as well that comes for other to exploit and create business on. And we are also taking the risk as a public agency so that the private sector can really develop um, consistent and reliable apps. So we are launching demonstration mission, like the one we do this month with machine learning and the Intel chip, just to check stuff, see where we can go. And that's the basis of innovation. And the key thing is to bring the talents to us. That's our main challenge. How can we avoid that a guy, an AI talent goes to advertising and bring him to work on solving the problems of the planet? So we need to raise awareness about this. Fascinating. And you made me just think maybe, like you said, like you said, there's plenty of talent that has been doing this for, for other purposes, whether it's clicking on ads or things like that, whether it becomes a full-time job shift for them, or maybe we even need an environmental insights reservist score, where it's but, something uh, they do in addition to their job or something like that. David, that I give you an anecdote. I went to an AI conference uh, with top guys there. Nobody knew that there was this big opportunity to get 15 petabytes for free on the state of the planet. They went banana when they heard that. They want to work <laughs> on this and have an impact on mankind. So we need to get them aware. Nice. All right. Well, we'll do our best to carry the banner here at the Atlanta Council. Uh, I'd like to circle back to John because right before the uh, storm decided to cut out power for me, I was going to actually ask you a question, which is, What's one of the most exciting experiments that you're looking forward to doing involving biology and life in space, if you could share that? Well, um, I think as the smaller platforms are starting to participate in lunar missions and beyond Earth orbit, uh, there have been very small satellites that have gone beyond Earth orbit and understanding the effects of radiation. Um, there are possibilities where in some biological experiments and activities, uh, a 30 day exposure in space equivalent is equivalent to a human's lifespan on Earth for 
10, 20, 30 years. So being able to apply space to learn and understand uh, more about our own uh, physiology and our own existence on earth is very important. But then also being able to prepare uh, and lay the groundwork for our astronauts and travelers to travel safely in space, I think are the most important things. So being able to miniaturize systems, integrate smart uh, AI and cloud and embedded systems and capabilities uh, in these platforms and conduct these long-term uh, adaptive uh, type experiments and knowledge gathering, I think are really the really important areas. Exciting. And, and, and that then now circles to, to Peter. Peter, you know, you're talking about a fascinating way of bringing together, like you said, events that are happening here on the planet, events in the media, events in the world, some space. Uh, how do we make sure that this, 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 is, this is a technology and, a, and an activity for good? I mean, obviously you're leading the banner on making sure it's good, but how do we make sure it doesn't result in something that, that, that's not intended in the type of future as well? Yeah, it, it, thanks for giving me the hard questions, David. I, I think um, well, I'm, I'm giving you know, softballs to others, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> for, Frederick mentioned this earlier, and and you asked the question of you know how do we uh, ensure that data from space is used for good? I, I would broaden the question to say how do we ensure that data is used for good? And today you almost can't talk about the rise of you know the emerging tech sector without. Uh, addressing this question of personal privacy and and how do we balance that and and look I will tell you it may be very uncomfortable to think about but we are entering a time when it's going to be very difficult to hide anything on the planet the, the number of sensors that are being distributed in space but also on the ground the, the, the statistics that I have seen about the build out of 5g networks project uh, in the next decade, 200 billion IoT connected devices through 5G networks. Those are 200 billion sensors across the planet that are collecting data on everything that's happening and everything that you do and I do. So how do we, how do we really enter into this new world where the, the earth is a sensor and, and we have privacy issues and and personal concerns about um, government and others tracking the activities of their citizens. Um, these are really hard, hard challenges that we're going to face um, in the coming decades. I, I think one, um, the the one answer that I would give, maybe it seems trite, but I think transparency is very important in all of this. And and in fact, I think the more that you can make this. Uh, data available and and make things transparent. Uh, the more you have the ability to really um, provide some oversight uh, into how that data is used and and um, ensure that it is used for good. Excellent. And and, and I liked what you said. Um, transparency of purpose, bringing people together so they understand why you're doing what you're doing, and if you need to, almost having some some way of actually like external validation of that. Um, I mean, it's one of the fascinating things about blockchain, you know, it's, it's fascinating about blockchain that you make the ledger publicly available and everybody gets to process against that and see uh, where that data has gone, what's happened with that. So those are interesting concepts that maybe get combined here that, that are part of the solutions to that problem. Yes, especially if we link it to, to like you said, making sense of the planet and what Pierre is talking about with environmental insights. That would definitely be a, a way to make sure it's used for good. Uh, Jody, I saw you had a rejoinder real quick. So if you wanted to chime in. Yeah. So, you know, I think that on one hand, absolutely 100%, we should be looking at how do we make this data available to everybody. Um, but in keeping with the um, the concerns about the, the privacy is a real big concern. So um, for example, I was trying to deploy um, augmented reality glasses to workers in a factory in Germany. And I have never seen such a big uprising against this idea because you know they have lived in a history of um, being sort of observed all the time and that being used for very bad things. The other thing is that in this economy, when we start to move towards this uh, autonomy future, 
data becomes the currency, right? It's, it, the algorithms are the algorithms and yeah, you might have a unique algorithm um, and good for you, but really when we're talking about these massive data, like machine learning systems that we could deploy through this sort of satellite orbit um, system, suddenly the data becomes super critical to remain private to certain individuals because it becomes kind of their trade secrets. Their, their, it is their company, it is the data. So we need to come up with some methodology where we have public access to certain types of data and we have private access to very private data, either about my individual health or um, say, you know, my company is, um, you know, whole reason for being is contained in that data. Now, the problem with regulation, of course, is that we can see where um, if we regulate too early, we end up regulating out a lot of the, the really big wow things that we could do because we don't yet know what's possible. At the same time, that creates a scary situation because a lot of regulation happens as a result of something terrible happening and we make a law to prevent that from ever happening again. So it's, it's, it's such a really meaty and um, uncomfortable topic to discuss. Um, and I, I'm really curious to see if anybody else has some interest in that. I, I think I saw that, that, that Shane was going to volunteer a point. And so it may be on this topic, it may also be on a, a related one. But uh, Shane, I'm going to turn to you next. Yeah, actually, it does build on what Jody and Peter were talking about. I think a really important thing to think about in, in returning to our cloud and AI and space type of roots of the talk is totally agree and support that we want to make sure that we use data for good. And that's really important. And uh, even going back to Jody's previous comment, where you talk about meshing networks up in space, I want to highlight, we really also want to focus on, in the past, space has really lended itself to what you could consider bespoke approaches for security and for connectivity. And that is something that in the future with the cloud, we're really going to want to work on standardizing security approaches. And one of the benefits of the cloud will be we're going to be able to move towards reliability. So like kind of the way that you build a region or an availability zone, you'll have multiple data processing activities going on up there. You'll have multiple satellites in close proximity and they won't be doing a, a just independent activities. They'll be working together so that you know that the data is reliable and you're going to get this critical information that you're going to make decisions off of. Because once we get the world hooked on that type of operation, that is going to need to work all the time because there's going to be critical functions that are using that data to keep doing it. Then we're going to also need to really work hard to make sure that everything is secure because we're going to need to make sure the ground network, the link, and the satellites are themselves are secure so that you know that the data itself is good that you're trying to use for good. Otherwise, we are going to have malicious actors get in there and they're going to manipulate the data and they're going to manipulate decisions and business decisions by, by breaking in and doing what they want to with the data. So we're, we're really one of the big cloud things we need to push is the ability to go quickly and securely and in a way that the rest of our community already functions so that we can deliver reliable and secure data to make all these critical decisions from. Well said, Shane, and, and agree. We have to shift away from bestoke approaches because that's usually when things break. I think John has a quick rejoinder and I'm gonna to go to Frederick and then we'll go to the lightning round. But John, you look like you had a rejoinder real quick. No, I just wanted to make a comment that as we, we talk about uh, the use of cloud computing and AI uh, and all of the applications and so forth, one big thing that we need to think about is how do we train the workforce to produce these capabilities and utilize them uh, effectively. And so maybe uh, somehow the education component through cloud and group and team, global teaming and collaboration, virtual uh, integrated product teams or learning teams or groups uh, need to address this because uh, in STEM education, in a lot of cases, the students aren't able to understand this kind of stuff. Their teachers don't understand it as well. So how do we create the educational 
foundation for the next generation to continue this emerging uh, capability. I just wanted to make sure that point is out there. Very well said, and I'm going to circle to Frederick because when I last visited you last year, you actually introduced me to some very talented uh, middle school and high school uh, individuals. And, and maybe to synthesize what we heard here is if there's 50 petabytes of environmental information that's been observed from space, maybe we should make it available to middle schoolers and high schoolers and actually see what they could do with it and actually have it be a global competition of sorts or not even competition just what can you find in this data as a way to i mean i know you and i did science fairs when we were younger but this is almost maybe like the equivalent of space science fairs going forward and compare it with ground truth yes <laughs> so frederick i mean what bring it home for us and then we'll shift to the lightning round but but how how do, how do we engage people in in participating with this as the public and helping with making sense of space data so that's a very excellent point and uh, i'm really happy to have been part of this discussion because it's uh, touching on very important issues and i think we have a unique opportunity here because if we go back in history if we go back to late 90s early millennium we did go through all of this with the telco industry. So we have the tools already. We have the cha same challenges. It's just that we're taking it to a new business segment. We're including space into the cloud model. So all the same challenges that we have on ground that we've seen throughout the past 20 years, they will be the same challenges that we see in space. So we have now an opportunity which we didn't have when we went through this with the telco industry is that we know the challenges already so now when we build up the the apis the software infrastructure the security we have an opportunity to do it in a better way than we did 20 years ago and been patching on from that so i think there is a lot of things we can learn from history here and apply when we now take this into space well said. And, and, and like you said, we, we, we have lessons learned. We just need to make sure we apply them and then we encourage being bold, brave and benevolent going forward. All right. So we're now at about uh, eight minutes remaining. So we're going to shift to the lightning round. Uh, I'm going to go to each of you and ask for one or two tweet lengths. Uh, so we need to keep it fairly short. Recommendations for actions we can do that leaders can do in either the private or public sector to ensure that this what we're doing here benefits the public and benefits the world. And, and we're actually going to go first to John. And then we're going to go from there. So, John, would I be interested in your thoughts? What would you recommend as one or two tweet length recommendations to make sure there is benefit in what we're doing here? Well, understand the the value and benefit of of where AI can fit. How can you really apply it and make it not just a novelty, but how to apply it in meaningful and relevant applications? There are a lot of things, you know. Uh, my coke machine doesn't need to talk to me for instance but you know are there things that we can do really uh, uh focused activities that have a high priority uh and benefit for use excellent let's keep your focus make sure we think about what we really want to place our bets on as we go forward uh, so now next i'll go to peter then jody then pierre so peter what would be your one or two recommendations here well, I think one of the things we talked about was the privacy issue. And uh, the, the one thing that I would push on governments uh, to do is uh, to create transparency in this environment. Very well said. Transparency matters and we need governments to lead the way. So thank you for that, Peter. Jody, what would be your recommendations? Well, we've sp spent a lot of time talking about um, data and how AI can operate using this sort of uh, connected orbit. But I think one of the things that we need to, that we haven't discussed that we need to really double down on to ensure that everybody is empowered by these tools is to look at how these tools get distributed to the edges, to developing countries and places like that. And how do we ensure that the people on the ground there have the um, necessary skill sets to be able to take advantage of these tools um, to solve real human problems in those locations. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a little bit of, we also have to be investing in training uh, people around the world to be able to level up their skills, but also we have to reduce the specialized knowledge required of uh, people to be able to leverage these systems. So 
that's I love that it's both learn but also seek to include and be as inclusive as possible and I'd love to do projects both in Africa and South America where we could use this whether it's for irrigation for food or things like that there's a lot of applications here. so many applications so Pierre what would be your recommendations to world leaders oh to world leaders okay <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm, I'm fully in line with what was said in particular, Jody. I mean, education is the best investment. Uh, what we are doing uh, in Europe and in ESA in particular is to try to build this environment where people can play with this data and these new tools. And we need really to attract and engage with these people at awareness level to show that it's really today a unique opportunity. It didn't happen five years ago, it's now. This full matching of AI and Earth observation, it's the perfect match. And if you can be part of it, you can actually create maybe the next unicorn or the way to understand what's happening on the planet to have full environmental transparency. So I would be, if I were uh, much younger, very excited to go into these fields because it's a field that would create job opportunities and that can do good for the planet. So I invite our participants to consider coding for the planet. I love that. Coding for the planet. I look forward to the next round of startups that come out as a result that are focusing on environmental insights from space. And then I look forward to when there's actually the ability to actually invest through a mutual fund or some other fund in space, AI, and, and the planet. So thank you for that, Pierre. So now Shane and, and Frederick to bring it home. Shane, what would be your recommendations for, for leaders to consider in this space? My main recommendation would be still follow a network methodology here, which means accept some failure and failing fast as we learn how to do compute in AI and ML up on orbit, and uh, accept that the overall network of all these proliferated LEO vehicles are gonna be able to survive one or two uh, spacecraft, maybe not succeeding. And so don't get risk averse, keep pushing the envelope and applying these key technologies so that we can uh, learn how to do it in space the way we do it on Earth. Well said, and as we see, we can even lose power here on the ground. So uh, things happen. There needs to be a willingness to experiment to gain expertise. Uh, Frederick, bring it home for us. Uh, well, that's always an easy task. I, I think we should just uh, look at the current environment. I think there are three different Mars probes on the way to Mars right now with two or three different landers and even a helicopter that will fly on Mars. So if we start to think about what is happening, we are living in an exponential time where we will move from planet Earth. We will actually, during our lifetime, move to Moon and we will move to Mars. And obviously, we are going to need some form of legislation how to behave in, in space. So obviously, ITU, uh, one of the United Nations units that are very involved in these questions, need to be even more involved or we need to find another body and start to talk about these questions. Because when I meet politicians, they are hardly aware of the fact that we will actually leave planet Earth during our lifetime. Well, I look forward, Frederick, when you are the Swedish Prime Minister uh, and, and maybe the first Swedish Prime Minister to go into space. But I want to thank all of you uh, as a guest panelist. This has been a great set of insights, really been informative, and hopefully more folks will watch this, not just world leaders, but CEOs, as well as the public and educators, because we have a lot of work to do to make sure that the decade ahead is beneficial. That said, there's a lot of excitement when it comes to AI and computing on orbit. And I thank each of you for all that you do as positive change agents. Take care.